All right, hey guys, in this lecture today, we're gonna to be talking about something you might have heard about in American history. It's called Valley Forge, and it's the famous place where Washington decides to winter his troops um, in the winter of 1777 to 1778 there in Pennsylvania. Uh, Valley Forge was a farm that was about 18 miles northwest of Philadelphia. And a little bit of background on this, um, remember that we had just had that very critically successful turning point, uh, the Battle of Saratoga, where colonial troops under the command of Horatio Gates and Benedict Arnold are able to get a surprising victory um, and defeat the British uh, Major General John Burgoyne, or Johnny Burgoyne, um, and his 9,000 British troops. Uh, they're at Saratoga. And with that crucial battle, um, we are going to start to see in the next uh, coming months, uh, while Washington's troops, the main Continental Army, are wintered at Valley Forge, some movement on getting some hardcore serious European allies on board of the American cause against the British, and that will be the French. But meanwhile, you, you also have the situation with Washington's main force, because remember, he was not at Saratoga. And while Saratoga was happening in New York, Washington is down in Pennsylvania, desperately, desperately fighting to defend the city of Philadelphia, which remember at this time was basically the capital for the 13 colonies. It was where the Continental Congress had met and, and it's where our government was. Um, and the British troops under command of General Howe were coming for it. So Washington will try to defend it unsuccessfully, both at the battles of Brandywine and Germantown um, in the fall, around the same time that Gates and Benedict Arnold are winning at Saratoga, Washington is losing. Um, and because he loses at Brandywine and Germantown, Howe is able to come in um, and take Philadelphia, our capital. The Continental Congress is forced to flee. So that was a devastating blow to morale. And remember, it's not until after Saratoga in the next several months, because correspondence is very slow going across the sea. The French also are going to need, you know, they, they need to think about whether they want to join us or not. Um, and you, you have some other factors at play here with why the French will eventually join on our side. I haven't mentioned this, but old Benjamin Franklin, our good old diplomat, does actually become the first real American diplomat. He is sent by the Continental Congress as an envoy uh, to deal with the French and try to urge them um, onto our side. And so Benjamin Franklin takes up residence um, in Paris. In fact, if you go to Paris today, there is a, an amazingly large and grandiose statue of Benjamin Franklin right there um, in one of the city centers. They also have statues to George Washington and others. Um, there will famously be a, a Frenchman who comes to America um, around this time named the Marquis de Lafayette. He was a French aristocrat, very young. Um, he was only uh, 19 when he, he came on shore in America to fight for this, this new revolutionary cause. Um, and eventually he will uh, become a favorite of General Washington. Washington um, is about 45 at the time of the Revolutionary War. And one thing that um, I don't know if we've mentioned yet in class, but, but Washington and his wife, Martha, they're never able to actually conceive any children of their own. Um, it, it was probably a, something that was wrong on Washington's end since Martha had already had children from her previous marriage when she was Martha Curtis. Um, but regardless, because of this fact, Washington has a tendency throughout his adult life to take on many young men um, as kind of a, in, a, in a fatherly role, you know, to mentor and guide them and, and become like a father to them. And he does this um, for not only the, Mar the young Marquis de Lafayette, who will become known as the hero to two worlds, the hero of the American and French revolutions and stuff, um, but also to like a, a young Alexander Hamilton, who himself had been an orphan, um, and, and to many other um, young, very important uh, men during this time period, Washington mentors them kind of as a father would. Even says in some of his correspondence and letters that, you know, he, he saw himself, his, himself as like a father to these guys. Uh, but regardless, 
um, this is all happening um, in this this winter. And since the British have taken Philadelphia, um, our, one of our most important cities, Washington can't go too far away. He needs to keep the, the heat on the British so that they aren't inclined to just stay in Philadelphia forever. Um, so he needs to sur- got, kind of guard the surrounding countryside. Um, and that is, that is why he decides to set up shop for the winter at Valley Forge, which is just 18 miles away. Um, and this was a very, you know, lush farmland. The the yield on the, the crops had been very good this year. So, I mean, there should have been plenty of supplies and food to go around um, for the, the winter months. They're going to camp at Valley Forge for about six months. Um, but if you know anything about Valley Forge, it doesn't really turn out that way. What I'm going to do next, and I'm experimenting with this, and there's probably a better way to do it, but you all know that I'm technologically uh, not very savvy, is I'm going to try to play for you guys uh, this video um, kind of about George Washington. And um, it's one of the soundtracks from the musical Hamilton set to video clips from the AMC show Turn. Um, both of which I highly recommend if you want to get engaged in the Revolutionary War. We have a lot of amazing, awesome uh, media um, from very, you know, just the last few years that you can enjoy. Um, and so I want to introduce you guys to both Turn and Hamilton here in this uh, in this clip. And um, I want you to pay attention to kind of the struggles that Washington is going through. While he's at Valley Forge, it's not just going to be the struggle to keep morale up among his troops. It's also going to be the struggle against their severe lack of supplies. It's going to be a struggle against exposure, the elements. The temperature while they were at Valley Forge for six months between December of 1777 and June of 1778 was actually pretty temperate. But remember, most of these soldiers don't even have shoes. They don't have blankets. If you go out in 40 degree weather without like a coat, you're going to be cold. And these these soldiers, they don't even have anything close to a coat, a lot of them. Um, many of the guards, like people would come into the camp and they'd see guards without shoes and socks. And it's, it's ridiculous. Um, so these are some of the things that he's facing. He's also politically facing challenges to his, his leadership. Uh, remember that um, there were many that were talking about Charles Lee, one of his lieutenants being, um, you know, basically supplanting Washington. And after his victory at Saratoga, many, um, including future President John Adams, um, one of the delegates from Massachusetts, was talking about replacing Washington with the hero of Saratoga, Horatio Gates. Um, and so Washington is trying to fend back these these other contenders for his his generalship. He's trying to keep his army together. He's trying to keep them from dying from disease and dysentery and starvation and exposure. And he has no money with which to do any of this. Washington himself had already agreed basically not to take any money. He wasn't being paid to be the commander in chief of the Continental Army. Uh, he said that you know he was independently wealthy. He was a planter down in in Virginia. Um, and so he said at Mount Vernon, so he said that he would, you know, he, he wouldn't take any money from, from the Continental Congress. Um, some of these other generals, they wanted to be paid very lavishly, but Washington is spending money for his troops out of his own pocket. Um, you know, he's doing whatever he can to try to help them out here. So anyway, watch this clip and, um, just get a flavor for kind of the scene and what was happening here. And maybe you can kind of picture what some of these characters might have been like. Again, I'm going to try to make this work. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. Technology in me, it's kind of scary. Nope. Just a millisecond, 
guard and tell the people how I feel a second. Now I'm the model of a modern major general, the venerated Virginia veteran who's been a wall lining up to put me up on a pedestal, writing letters to relatives and relish in my elegance and eloquence. Washington is very good at dancing. The truth is in your face when you hear the British cannons go. Any hope of success is fleeting. How can I keep leading when the people I'm feeding keep retreating? The Battle of Monmouth. This young man with Washington, you keep seeing, is supposed to be Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton. Sorry for the language. Hamilton. That's Charles Lee. Some assistance. I admire how you keep firing on the British from a distance. I have some questions, a couple of suggestions. How to fight instead of fleeing west. Yes, well, Your Excellency, you wanted to see me. Hamilton, come in. Have you met first? Yes, sir. We keep meeting. As I was saying, sir, I look forward to seeing your strategy play out. Burr, sir, close the door on your way out. Have I done something wrong, sir? Contrary, I called you here because our odds are beyond scary. Your reputation precedes you, but I have to laugh. Sir? Hamilton, how come no one can get you on their staff? Sir, don't get me wrong. You're a young man of great renown. I know you stole British cannons when we were still downtown. Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox wanted to hire you to be their secretary. I don't think so. But why are you upset? I'm not. It's all right you want to fight. You've got a hunger. I was just like you when I was younger. Head full of fantasies of dying like a martyr. Yes, dying is easy, young man. Living is harder. Why are you telling me this? I'm being honest. I'm working with a third of what our Congress has promised. We are a powder keg about to explode. I need someone like you to lighten the load. So, I am not throwing away my shots. I am not throwing away my shots. And you are just like my country. I'm not stopping and holding. I am not throwing away my shot, son. We are out, out, out now. You need all the help you can get. I have some friends. Lawrence Mulligan, Marquis de Lafayette, or King, what else? Out, 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 out there. I need some spies on the inside. Some king's men who might let some things slide. I'll write to Congress and tell them we need supplies. And rally the guys, pass to the element of surprise. I'll rise above my station. Organize your information till we rise to the occasion of our new nation, sir. Here comes the general. All right. So, um, hopefully, that gave you a little sense of kind of the drama that we're dealing with here. Plus, I just really absolutely love. Um, the guy who made this, combining those turn AMC clips with um, the the soundtrack from the musical Hamilton was genius. Anyway, so this is the situation at Valley Forge. It's very bad. Washington has 12,000 troops. In summary, 2,000 of them roughly are going to die, um, a lot of them from disease. They had about 1,500 horses. Almost all of the horses are going to die at Valley Forge. Um, because they simply don't have enough food. Soldiers will be starving as well. And you're like, but Miss Ramsey, you just told us how this is in lush, you know, farmland. How could this possibly be? Yeah, but see, here's the thing. Most of the farms around Philadelphia, they were selling their crops 
to the British who were encamped in the city. Um, they were smuggling them into the British, and they were being paid in pounds sterling and sometimes even in gold. Washington ain't got no money. The Continental Congress, they ain't got no way to make money. They, they tried printing um, continental money, but it was worthless. That's, that's going to be a common thing you're going to see throughout many wars, is that the government will try to just print off money, but that money becomes worthless. There's nothing backing it up. And so it wasn't, you know, it didn't have any value. People can't accept it if it's not going to mean anything. And so all these farmers, um, you know, Washington is outraged. He sees them as traitors, but I mean, farmers got to live too, right? So they're selling to the British, not to the Americans. And the Americans, as a result, are starving to death. Like I said, there will be some who even die from exposure in like 30, 20, 30, 40 degree weather because they don't have basic clothing or, or even shoes. Um, and then all these rotting bodies and, and especially these large, uh, corpses of these, these horses, um, whenever the temperature would get above freezing, um, you'd have these air pockets basically exploding from these corpses that were filling the air with the stench and it was awful. And of course that's going to lead to maggots and flies and, and disease. Um, they built, uh, over a thousand little, uh, log cabins and tent structures and, and other things to try to give the troops some um, shelter, but those are going to be very makeshift. They're not going to keep soldiers very warm. Um, disease is the biggest killer that he's dealing with here at Valley Forge. With so many dying from like smallpox, Washington's actually going to do something pretty, <laughs> pretty revolutionary. See what I did there? Yeah. Okay, I'll stop now. Anyway, he is going to inoculate his troops for smallpox. Um, so this is like the beginning of vaccinations. Um, it was a super, super new theory at this time. I mean, they don't even know about germ theory. Otherwise, they would have been, you know, exceptionally careful about the, the dead corpses just lying around. So, I mean, this is a society in the late 1700s that doesn't even know about germ theory. But there is ideas about inoculation, that you put a small sample of a disease inside your body for your for your antibodies, your white blood cells to basically learn how to attack it. And then that will make you immune to that disease. That's inoculation. That's, that's how vaccines work. And so um, it was very rudimentary. They would literally just like get a, a little cut on your arm and then they would put um, a little bit of the blood or pus from um, a victim of smallpox inside that cut that they had just made on your skin, you're a healthy person. Um, and then they would, so they're giving you the disease. And then if you survived, then you were basically inoculated. So really rudimentary. Um, and this is what Washington has his troops do. Many of them thought he was crazy for this, uh, but it kind of stops all the, the death that was happening with the disease. Um, it, is, it is a very risky move on his part, uh, very cutting edge. I guess puns intended, um, but it will it will help. It will help. Another thing that is going to help Washington during this very very difficult time at Valley Forge is going to be the arrival of a Prussian commander named Baron von Steuben, and Baron von. Friedrich Steiben is going to be responsible for getting our ragtag group of colonial undisciplined yanks into shape. Because remember, that has been a, a big problem. That our soldiers, they have the enthusiasm, they have the dedication, okay? They, they know about these are the times of try men's souls. It's not going to be easy. They're, they're in it, and they're trying, but they, they lack the basic discipline that a professional army has, that what we were facing with the British troops, we just didn't have it. And so Steuben, coming from this Prussian background, remember that's like where the Hessians were from, these Prussian kingdoms that were very well known for their military prowess, he is going to relentlessly, under Washington's direction, uh, drill these continental troops in all kinds of basic formations, how to march and change formation as they're moving, which was something we totally didn't have a handle on, how to hold steady, you know, uh, as, as incoming onslaughts of bullets are raining down, and especially how to hold the line and, and not break when you have a bayonet charge. Remember at the Battle of Bunker Hill, that was finally when we capitulated the, uh, the Breed's Hill, the top there, 
um, and poor Dr. Joseph Warren died, was when the, the British bayonets came out. We saw that glint of steel and we're like, nope, we out. Um, and so these, these basic training skills that von Steuben gives the troops are going to be essential for our infantry to, to become um, a more modern European fighting force rather than a ragtag group of you know, militiamen that had trained every other month. <laughs> Um, and also you're going to have um, a Polish um, cavalry man. Uh, I believe his name was Podel. I can't remember. I know it's sort of a P, but he's also Polish. Um, he is going to be training our ragtag uh, group of, of couriers and their, their mounts to become uh, an elite European-style uh, cavalry unit. So we can actually have that um, on our side as well. And all this training takes place. And you, you also see, I mean, the beginnings of an international war here. That It's not just the British versus the Americans anymore. Starting with, with Valley Forge after the, the Battle of Saratoga, um, we're starting to have assistance from other European powers who want to join our side or maybe they just want to get back at the British. But you have this Polish support. You have this this Prussian uh, commander, von Steuben. And then, of course, you're going to have the French. Uh, Marquis de Lafayette had showed up um, right there in August of 1777. He was right there with Washington, um, suffering along with all the other troops at Valley Forge, this important French aristocrat, um, and also symbolizing the beginning of our, our French alliance. And it's during these six months at Valley Forge um, that Washington... Um, and by the way, he, he kind of has helped through this time, um, and his poise and, and charm will stay with him because uh, he does get his, his wife to come. Martha uh, Washington will be there to, to help out, and she even throws a little um, birthday party for George Washington there and kind of keeps spirits up. Um, you also had hundreds of uh, soldiers' wives um, and, and other women. <laughs> we won't talk about what they did. Uh, coming to Valley Forge, and Washington wasn't crazy about this, but he allowed it. Um, and these women who are uh, following along with the Continental Army are incredibly important. They're not going to be serving so much in in combat roles. Um, there was some notable exceptions. There were a few women who uh, snuck into um, regiments, basically dressed as as soldiers. They hid their gender. Um, but I, but I don't mean that. I mean, large scale, hundreds of women would join with the, the Continental Army, um, kind of in the baggage train. And these women served, uh, vital roles as nurses, uh, to, uh, help tend to the sick and dying soldiers. They also, uh, served other functions in addition to, you know, keeping companionship, which we're not going to talk about. Um, they also were there to do the laundry. They were there to cook. Um, these are things that logistically you must have to have a functioning force. Um, so all this is going on. Now, Washington, this is where he comes to his overall strategy that he's going to use for the rest of the war. And that is basically, we've, we've already discussed, but he doesn't have a force sizable enough and he, he lacks the basic supplies and money to defend strategic positions. Like we saw with Philadelphia, he wasn't able to keep um, the British away from our capital, you know, even even with the home field advantage. And so Washington comes to the uh, arrangement that basically his army is the revolution, that if he can keep his army out of British hands, he can keep the revolution alive. And that will be his strategy going forward that he sets upon at Valley Forge. The Battle of Monmouth. Uh, so I have another uh, Hamilton video there. Again, that's Hamilton soundtrack with clips from uh, the AMC show Turn, Washington Spies, which is about uh, Benjamin Talmadge and the Culper Ring that is going to be spying for the Continental Army uh, there in New York City while it was um, basically taken by the, the British forces during the war. Great, great show, um, but I... I don't have this one preloaded on my phone for the, the sound, um, and I'm, again, not very technologically advanced. So if you want to watch this one, you could either go to YouTube, super easy, or you could just go to our Google Classroom and go to the, the you know this page on our uh, lecture, and, and you can watch all these videos, all, all that your heart desires. Uh, but basically, the Battle of Mammoth is going to take place in the spring after Valley Forge, um, and it's kind of an inconclusive 
uh, we don't know who wins this one, basically. We'll call it a draw. Um, but the situation is thus. Now that the French have formally entered on the side of the Americans, thanks to our victory at Saratoga, and also thanks to the fact that the British, I'm oh, sorry, the French hate the British, and the fact that you had a very crafty and excellent diplomat in Benjamin Franklin there in Paris, uh, urging the French to, to get on our side. Um, now that the French are with us, the war has totally changed. The dynamic is completely different because now it's the British who are basically on guard. See what I did there with the French? On guard. Um, and so General Clinton, um, remember one of the big three British generals, Burgoyne's kind of out of it now, um, he is going to be um, ordered to basically retreat out of Philadelphia because um, they need to be on the coast where the British Navy can support them. Being in Philadelphia is too far inland, um, and the fear was that the Continental Army of the French would surround them and take their big force. So the British are going to leave Philadelphia, and the colonists all heave a deep sigh of relief. Um, but Washington's thinking this is a great opportunity. You know, now that he and his forces have survived that harsh winter at Valley Forge, now maybe is the time um, for them to show what they've learned and to get a big morale boost um, and to also show the French, hey, you know, you, you chose the right side. Look what we can do. And so the Battle of Monmouth is going to take place in the spring 1778 in New Jersey as the British troops under the command of uh, General Clinton are making their retreat and trying to get to the coast and then eventually back to New York City uh, where they were based. And um, it's basically going to be an attack on the baggage trains. Remember the, the end of a, the soldiers' marches where they would have the wagons with all the supplies? General Lee, Charles Lee, the, the one that many wanted to replace Washington, is going to attack the British rear guard as they're retreating. And it eventually becomes a full-scale engagement. And the, the fronts of the British troops circle back around and overwhelm Lee. And this is kind of the end of Lee. He's totally embarrassed because he's forced to have his troops retreat. Um, and so he gets the heck out of there. And Washington and the rest of the Continental Army come up just as Lee and his smaller force is starting to retreat. Washington's like, you turn your butts around and you're going to fight because y'all are not about to make me look weak after we just sacrificed so much over this winter and we learned so much under von Steuben. Get your butts back out there. And so this becomes the Battle of Mama, full-scale engagement, pitched European-style battle, where the American forces prove that we've learned a lot. Um, and eventually it's about the cannon placements that are happening. Um, the cannons on both sides are firing at one another. Uh, and on this very hot New Jersey day, um, the cannons, you, know, you can imagine how hot they get after, after they fire. There would be um, a lot of runners that would basically have to bring pitchers of water uh, to run over the metal of the cannons after they fired to cool the metal down so it wouldn't melt. And again, talking about the, the role of women uh, during the Revolutionary War, some of them do, um, you know, there, there's very few that serve in combat, but there were a lot here at the Battle of Monmouth who are going to take these pitchers of water up to the front lines of these cannons um, and cool these cannons off so that we can continue to barrage the British forces. Um, and that's the, the famous story of Molly Pitcher. We don't know if there was actually a, a Molly as one of these, these women that was cooling off the cannons, but um, that has become an iconic image of the Battle of Monmouth. And eventually what happens is that um, Washington's forces take the day. The British uh, eventually are able to uh, get out of there in the middle of the night. They do a Washington Trenton style sneak away um, and they escape and we kind of let them. But Washington has just faced the, the full onslaught of the British force and he has kept the field. And so he's able to uh, basically swing this into a victory and the Continental Army will seize, or sorry, the Continental Congress will seize on this as, as a victory to showcase, you know, look how much we've grown. Uh, look what we were able to do here. Um, and so, in general, if you see the Battle of Monmouth on the test, just remember when this, this takes place. It's after Valley Forge. It's after we've survived this terrible time. And we've come out of it a lot stronger thanks to the training that we received there. Now we're able to fight pitched battles um, in the European style and keep up with them.
All right. We will stop there for today. Thank you guys so much. And remember to keep working on your song project and your reading quizzes. Bye, guys.